I'm Helena, and I'm going to talk about using data for stories, which is something that I have been doing as a journalist for quite some time now. Uh, this will not be technical. I am not a programmer. Uh, the, the code you will see, I'm very sad to say, will be in Perl. But, <laughs> and it, nevertheless, I thought we'd start, actually, since I've worked many years in television, we'll, I'll start by showing you the product of sort of what I do, which is a television story. It will be in Swedish, but it will have subtitles. So try different levers, see if anything works. Here it comes. Men det finns brunnar i området som förorenas av arseniken och mätningar kring just badplatsen visar halter av cancerframkallande kolväten över gränsvärdet. Och arsenik i så höga halter att det finns risk för akut förgiftning. Utredarna har rekommenderat att man ska sanera och gräva ut badplatsen. Redan 2007 hittade man höga halter arsenik vid baden. Men den ansvariga kommunledningen kände inte till provresultaten innan SVT kom. Ja, då börjar man ju med presidenten i också. Och där är det ju en jag sakliga med det. Men det har vi inte sökt heller i det fallet. I det fallet har vi inte sökt sakliga med det. Än så länge i alla fall. Det finns nära tusen platser i Sverige som fått högsta riskklass för gifter som kan skada människor och natur. 86 av dem ligger i vattenskyddsområden. Och på 51 av de här platserna har man hittat föroreningar i grundvattnet. I bara tre fall har man tagit vattenprover som är rena. Resten, där befarar man föroreningar men har inte hunnit kolla. Som här i El. Här finns en hundra år en plantskola där man använder extremt giftiga bekämpningsmedel, DDT. Det användes det till en gång. Det var så. Ja, det är använder i alla plantor. Även ja. det här området är vattentäckt. Och 2007 skrevs en rapport om mycket stor risk för spridning till grundvattnet. Var du själv ute och sprutat? Ja, det hände. Men enligt Länsstyrelsens databas har man inte ens börjat en förstudie av vattnet. Nej, det är omöjligt att hinna jobba med alla de här objekten på en och samma gång. Och även om man bara kokar ner till vattenskyddsområden, högsta riskklass. Även där går det långsamt. Ja, men vi har inte resurser för att jobba med alla de objekten. På Uppsala stadspark då, där fanns också plantskola som troligen använt det till. Exponering kan ske genom hudkontakt, jordintag i munnen eller inandning av damm, säger utredningen. Men man säger inget till barnen som leker och flyter på marken. Stadsparken här i Uppsala står det kanske det är det. Mm. Ja, det var ett objekt som inventerades förra året. Finns det det där? Ja, det vet vi inte. Det är inte undersökt. Och Tärnsjö, också det vattenskyddsområde. 60 ton kromavfall från gamla garveriet finns i den lilla Tärnsjö. De närboende tycks veta att man knappast tar en dopp i den här sjön. Men det finns ju turister. Här ska man säga varning gift i sjö. Varning lev i barnplats. Liten skydd. Ja, ganska svår fråga att svara på, men eh, när det finns risk för akuta effekter då kan det ju finnas eh, risk med att till exempel sätta upp en skydd. Men har ni sett upp några skydd på sitt år? Eh, nej, det har vi inte gjort. They had had a meeting about a sign, but that's all. <laughs> Här ser vi valkatten i Lösta Ja, please. Yeah. Yeah. Let's not. Let's not do a repeat on that. Uh, here we are. Here we are. Good. Something is wrong. What is this? Okay. Let's see. There we go. So this is a project that we did a couple of years ago. That is sort of a 
explanation of what I think data journalism is. It is a online database with 80,000 places around Sweden uh, that we have uh, built sort of a, an online service on that where you can go and look for your own for your own where you where you live by yourself, and it's built on a database that comes from the 21 regions of Sweden. Uh, Everybody but one actually gave it to me in Excel. Uh, we plotted this, as you see, it has a couple of years because nobody uses Google Maps anymore, but at that time, everybody used Google Maps. Uh, and you can, of course, by using this service, this site, go in and look at how does it look in our, where I live. Uh, we took every single thing that was in the database and, and put it in the database, uh, put it online, but we also did call-outs. If you know anything about this place, please email us. Uh, if you want to know more about this place, we also put in an instruction how you make a freedom of information request yourself to ask for more information about this place. So we try to help the public in sort of getting more information if they suddenly realize that, wait a minute, I live next door to this glass uh, factory that has a lot of, that has been, has a lot of pollution in between it. Uh, but we didn't go there. We didn't stop by just putting everything out there because that is not journalism. That is just, you know, reporting. Uh, this is the areas of drinking water, protected drinking water. And this is the contaminated places. And then, of course, we did, we merged them together. We found the 86 places that you heard about in this. And then we could do reporting on that. Uh, and once we found them, we, of course, started doing sort of ordinary journalistic reporting. We asked for documents for these places. We talked to experts. We talked to locals. We went out there and did the story. So it's just, but instead of looking at 1,000 places, we had these 86 that we could look at and choose from. So we were much more defined in what we were doing. And we could do the story about the arsenic at the kids, uh, where the kids went swimming. But at that time, I also worked for Swedish television that has a number of regional offices, just as the BBC. We have a lot, number of regional offices around Sweden. So I could send out parts of the database to each of our regional offices. And each of them could do stories out from their local perspective. So this is just a few of all the stories that we did out of that database. Uh, which means that it also gave us, you know, a lot of coverage of this. So for me, data journalism is two things, basically. I use data to analyze, and then I can also present my results. And I can, you know, do ordinary things, sorting, grouping, counting, uh, and then, of course, doing interactive databases and maps. But it's very important for me that the methods that I learn is the method to reach the goal. I have a journalistic problem that I need to be solved, and I might have to learn a technical method to solve that problem. Uh, I'm a little bit allergic to the word, it used to be called computer-assisted reporting, and I'm sort of, or data journalism, as, it is, as if it's something else than journalism. But we never talk about telephone-assisted journalism reporting, or pen and paper, I mean, that are tools, and I would think that computers are, or data methods, or data science is another tool for us to have in our toolbox. And for me, all my, I would say that most of my bosses at Swedish Television and most of my bosses at The Guardian thinks that data journalism has to do with numbers. Oh, she's really good at math, they say. I actually suck at math. Ask my old math teacher. Uh, for me, it's the details, finding that detail that gives the story. Uh, a few years back, it's almost, it's five years now, I was at a gathering at one of the Swedish, sort of Swedish journalistic groups, and one of the big bosses in Swedish journalism stepped up, and we, we were talking at that time about the WikiLeaks Iraq database. And he said, well, it's meaningless. Why should journalists even bother with that kind of material? It's 390,000 documents. There's no journalist in the world who can read all this. And I was a little shy at that time, so I should have, what I should have done was to stand up and say, well, Mats, but that's, that was his name. 
It depends on how you do it. I just did it. And <clears throat> when I show this picture for journalists, they get really excited. For you, this is you know, not so exciting. I can just you know, select the documents that, has, that is about Sweden. And by doing that, instead of looking at 390,000 documents, I look at 57 documents, and everybody can read 57 documents. So with, with those documents, we did a lot of stories. We did stories about the Swedish weapons that were mentioned in the Iraq database. Uh, but this is my favorite story. This is the 28,658th document, or actually row in that database, because it was a database. And this is a story about a <clears throat> Swedish citizen with Iranian background who got caught in a, in a checkpoint and thrown in jail in Baghdad. And we could find him. There was, his name was print, printed. We could find him uh, working at, now working at a gas station in, in Gothenburg in Sweden. And he could tell his story. And sorry, and he could tell his story to us, and we could sort of tell the story behind the document. And that is the detail in the, that's the needle in the haystack. Another thing when it comes to data journalism is different things. Simple analysis, for instance, the horrible events that happened in Charleston uh, just this week. Uh, we were, uh, we wanted to tell the story and explain the story, of course. So what we did was that we went to the United States Statistical Bureau, Census Bureau, and they have amazing statistics. They have the racial profiles of every block in the US. So I could go there. I could download the data for Charleston. I could get the, the database. Uh, I could make a very, very simple calculation, which calculated the percentage of whites and black and uh, American Indian and so on for each block. <coughs> And the D equals zero is just because I don't want division by zero when there's no people in that, you know, in some of the blocks there were no people. And we could do a story the next day. This, brought, this, was, this was on the web a couple of, uh, during the afternoon, uh, which had different explanations, but also had this map uh, describing how the racial profile was and how it actually had changed over the years. Uh, if we do a little bit more complicated, one of the big issues when you're doing data journalism is actually extracting the data and cleaning the data. I think I spend, with a story, at least 60% of my time getting the data into a format that I can actually then analyze it with. Uh, this is a story I did previous this year where a reporter came to me and said, I want to look at this organization, this American organization that helps people uh, donate money to right wing, or not right wing, because that sounds like they're Nazis, they're not, uh, like sort of conservative organizations. Among those, a lot of climate, among those, a lot of organizations that deny climate change, or at least questions climate change in different kinds. So this is a tax form from the, Swede from the US tax authorities. It's a PDF. It's a picture PDF, which means that it has, it doesn't have, I, has, I have to OCR it before I can do anything with it. Uh, and within that, there's pages and pages of tables of the organizations that this organization is giving to. Uh, and what I have to do is OCR it. When you OCR it, it looks like that, not exactly pretty. I have to turn it into something I can use. Uh, and you can see that I also have to code the organizations. You see that the OCR on the top, the, the first row can read, maybe. I have to code it so that I get the names uh, standardized. And then, once I'm here, this took me a week. Once I'm here, it's very easy to do all the summing and could see how much of the money that they spent were actually spent on organizations that question climate change. And this is also a thing. I work together with reporters. That's my job. I work together with reporters to help them tell the story and let data drive the story. I can't give them 
you know, an, a huge Excel file. They all cringe and don't do anything. So my job is also to make this as accessible as possible. So hence the sort of pretty thing here, saying that this is, this is what I found. This is the highest organizations. This is the little errors that I found in it so that, so that they know and can sort of say, okay, we'll live with the fact that we have a difference in the total amount that they said and the total amount that I calculated of 0.15%. So then we did this story that got pretty well received uh, about the secretive donors that give the climate change group money. You can also use MAP for analysis. We looked at MAPs for presentation, but maps, MAPs for analysis. This is a story we did very quickly also. This is also a new story done by on a day where the parliament, the House of Commons, were, had a law in that they were going to decide on where they want to go and exclude all a lot of areas from fracking. So they want to exclude the protected areas, the groundwater areas, the uh, national parks and so on. So what we did basically is that we took all the shape files of all these areas, put them on top, and then on the top of that we put the areas that were already approved for fracking. And we could then do the story that 40% of the area that was uh, aimed for fracking was, would now to be a ban. I think they backed on that law, unfortunately, after that. But we did this very quickly. If you do a little longer analysis, I use programming to do data. This is um, the European Parliament. The European Parliament votes once or twice every month. Uh, and nowadays there are a website that looks at this, but when I was doing this, it wasn't. Uh, they publish their votes as PDFs or Word documents. And they look like this. So you, and they are not pictures actually though, so they're easier to sort of, I don't have to do the OCR for these, but all the last names of all the people, no matter what nationality the parliamentarian comes from, from the party group. So within here somewhere, is a Swede, and I wanna keep track of the, Swede, of the Swedes and how they voted. So this is, this is Pearl. And this is basically me extracting the data and checking uh, and, and calculating, finding all the people that said yes, all the people that said no, and all the people that abstained their vote. And by doing that, I get that into a database uh, that has actually both the date, but also the time. And it showed that the time actually made sense when I did the story. I didn't know that when I did the the story to start with, but the time actually made it made a big point. So what I could do with this is sort of look at all the suites and also look at how they were present at the parliament. And that's when the time made a difference because I actually found out that some of them left very early. So after 12 o'clock on a certain day, they weren't, sorry, they vote, in a, they vote a whole week, that week every month. So I could find out that they, they were leaving very, very early and that when there were many votes left because they had so, such a long time to travel, they said. Uh, so we could then do the story. I would say that this is, this is an old project that I still show because I spent three months on this and it became 2.40 in a news segment. It became a 2.40 minutes news segment and that was it. You could say that I didn't invest my, my time very well. Uh, another story, also using programming, actually I did recently, I did this this autumn, just coming to Guardian. This was my fourth, first story at the Guardian. And this was also an idea from a reporter. A reporter came to me and he said, I'm using Reddit quite a lot, he said, and I must admit that I had a very, at that time, a very vague idea of what, of what read it was. And, but he said, I see that there's a lot of ugly stuff in there. And still, it's considered something that we, especially The Guardian, if 
a story hits Reddit, we're really happy because it means that it gets a lot of views around the world. So I say sometimes that I spend my first month at The Guardian looking at porn. That's not really true, but somewhat. There's a lot of, there's a lot, as you know, probably all of you, there's a lot of sites and reddits that are G-rated in any kind. I found out, though, that I could just look at the moderators, and I didn't have to look at the actual pictures. This is the moderators of the very horrible group called Cute Female Corpses. I've actually been and looked at those pictures. They are, it is what it is. It is exactly what it is. It's Cute Female Corpses. Uh, so what I did was that I extracted all the moderators, uh, put them into a database, and wanted to find out where were, if they were moderators, what were they moderating? And what we could see was that there were moderators for the really big, good groups, so to say, that also moderated this not so good things. So by using, as you saw, Access and Excel, uh, we could write this story where we looked at cleaning up the mess behind, the, uh, behind Reddit. And what I could find, for instance, was the, the very big group all that has pictures that you say all about also moderates. People that moderate that also moderate drunk girls. Or people that moderate earth porn, which is actually not porn. Things that are called porn in Reddit is usually not porn. It's just pretty pictures. They also moderate the beautiful little group called Watch People Die. Uh, so that was a story that also got a pretty good. Just to show you that you can also use it for a little you know, less serious. If we talk about presentation, uh, you could do very simple presentations. For instance, this is a database of all the traffic cameras, all the speed cameras around Sweden uh, that I got actually from the, uh, from the transportation board in Sweden. I just put them into a map. This is Tableau. And then I put a reporter, I, I put a reporter at one of the, actually I put a reporter there, I think, one of the really high and he could just stand there and say, this is one of the highest, uh, the, the cameras that catches the most people. And we could do three days before Christmas, we could, do, we could publish this map and tell people, watch out on the road, this is where the cameras are. Uh, if you look at a little bit more advanced presentation, this is also a project we did at Swedish Television, where we wanted to look at youth and crime. And as in London, or as in uh, all countries, there are suburbs or areas that have this, you know, that have this problem with there's a, lot of, there's a lot of crime, especially among the youth. But we wanted to see whether or not that wasn't true in other cities as well, just focusing on Malmö, which is a town in southern Sweden, and Stockholm, as we do in Sweden, maybe not, may not be good. So what we got from the Census Bureau was data on a very small statistical geographical area. So that a city, maybe there's between, between 500 and 2,000 people in each of those areas. And this is the smallest statistical area you can use. So we got the population. We got the population between 15 and 19. And then we asked how many uh, that resided in that area was also taken, judged in court. And then we could just calculate the percentage. And by doing that, we found that almost in every city, almost in every city in Sweden, or in every town in Sweden, there were these areas. There were a lot of people, a lot of young kids that were, that were you know, criminal anyway. A caveat is that we didn't make any difference between if they were sentenced for murder or if they were sentenced for driving their moped too fast. So, I mean, there's a, there's a caveat and that you have to sort of think about that. But, and we also did the gray areas here. This is the city or the town of Borås. There uh, are areas where there were too few youth to do, there would only be one or two, so we excluded them. So we could see that in every, in every town we had this. 
And the same thing here, we could do a lots and lots and lots of stories around Sweden by doing this. If we look at visualizations, which I think sometime has taken over data journalism, I think that we should think about it both as an analytic tool and as a visualization. And sometimes I think the focus of, analysis, of visualizations are maybe a little too much. Uh, this is a visualization we did that I'm, I think is quite cool. It's the whole population of Sweden divided up by income. So 1%, one little figure here is 65,000 people. And in 1991, you can see that the income level of people were very sort of put together. And if we go on to 2012, you can see that the income levels had changed very much. Uh, and you can see that it was spread out. And also we'd had much more poor people, but also, of course, much more very rich. And this was an interactive tool, so you could look at the different years. You could look at females and men. You could look at young and old. You can look at geogra geography, so you could compare your own town with Stockholm, for instance, and see the difference in, eco in economy there, and so on. Another income visualization, this is where do I fall in the income, in the income sort of within the incomes. So if I give my own monthly income, I can, and I can compare myself with females who are 47, I can see that 85% of the females earn less or earn more, earn less than I do. This is one of the favorite visualizations we did. It is not easy, but I love that it takes a very, very complicated thing and sort of makes it understandable. This is all the schools in Stockholm and the final grade for the obligatory school, um, the ninth grade. So the black line in the middle is the average for the, for the country. So you can see that there are schools that are performing very poorly and there are schools performing very poorly. And then we colored all the school according to the parents and the education level on the parents. So the green one is parents that have uh, gone to university and the red ones are parents that only have gone through the nine-year nine obligatory school. So you can see that, and I had a reporter who did the story of this that said, you know, he didn't use that as a speaker, but he said that in some schools you could put a monkey as a teacher because it doesn't matter because the kids that come there are so well prepared and so by their parents so that you, they just sail through without anything. And the interesting schools is, of course, this school. That obviously is doing something right. They're lifting their students to another level. And in some cities like Malmö in the south of Sweden, the pattern is even more uh, horrible. To go back to the Guardian, this is the Guardian poll projection. I know the polls were wrong. But if we, for a minute, sort of think about that, the fact that if the polls had been right, this is the projection that is built on the polls, so yes, the polls were wrong. But when we did this, uh, it is an interesting way of doing this. We did this all in Google Spreadsheets. So we took, we collected all the polls. We calculated the average of all the polls. That's what we do here. Uh, we then looked at the votes that were cast in 2010. We looked at the national result that were cast in 2010. And then we made a formula that took the polls, took the swing, and calculated for each constituency what would the conservatives get if the polls were right, if the polls were right. And then, of course, we did, we had to do special cases for some places, and then we did the calculation, uh, counting, all the, counting all the seats that they would get. And this was done, the polls were, in put, put, it in, put in the spreadsheet every day. And that's the main reason why we use the Google spreadsheet because the posts were put in by people who, we, could, we didn't have the time to sort of build a tool to put in all the polls. So Alberto Nardelli, who is the brain behind this, he put in the new polls as soon as they got out. And our great visuals team programmed this. 
and it turned out all wrong. Uh, a couple of more, uh, a couple of more examples. Matching data is something that always thrills journalists because they think that's the coolest thing. This is a story I did about who I tried to find lobbyists in Sweden. So this is all the visits that were done, all the people that came and visit the Swedish Parliament, and as you see, I got that in a in a text PDF. But uh, Let's see. I OCR'd it, uh, put it into a database. I had a little FOIA trouble there, but come on. Oh. But by doing that, I didn't find that many lobbying companies. So what I did was that I went into the Swedish lobby companies, and they are very eager to brag about the people that work for them, because that their, that's their commodity. So these are the people that work for one of the, or worked, for one of the lobbying companies in Sweden. And this is Emily. She works for Sund Kommunikation. So I had all the visits in one table. I have all the lobbyists from the 10 biggest lobbying companies in Sweden in another table. And I connect them in access. Uh, and by doing that, I get some hits, and of course, if the person has a very common name, I just, I can't use that. But there's only one Emily in Sweden, I checked, and in Sweden we can check those things. So I could see that she had been there a number of times, uh, working as a lobbyist for the Swedish Taxi Association, actually. And we could do a story that was, this is influencing policy, is the story called, uh, to do this. Uh, my last example has to do more about data gathering, actually. Sometimes, and this I, I say, this type of data journalism that my, my bosses at Swedish Television were very fond of that. It's all The Guardian's fault, actually. The Guardian did, many years ago, The Guardian did an amazing product where they, by a freedom of information request, got hold of a half a million paper documents or PDF documents, but picture PDFs of all the expenses for all the MPs. And you've, you've been British, you've probably heard about this project. Uh, and what the Guardian said is, we can't look at this because it's all pictures. We can't do any kind of data analysis on this. So let's build a tool and ask the public for, for help. So that's what they did. This is a very, now that I'm at the Guardian, I could probably get this picture in a better so very, so I'm sorry it's very sort of blurry. But this is the expenses of Stephen Pounds. And the people helping the public, when the public helped the Guardian with this, they could click on this is a non-interesting document or this is an interesting document or this is a hell of an interesting document. Investigate this. Uh, so by doing that, they could get a lot of stories. They could help get help to find the stories. We were a little fascinated by this and we wanted to do our own project and we have a TV show in Sweden called Crime of the Week. It's primetime television and it's not what you think it is. You think it's something sleazy. It's run by a professor in criminology and it talks very seriously about crime and it's very popular. And yes, it's a little sleazy sometimes. Uh, and he, the professor wanted actually to find out. He's always his research has always been looking at police performance. He's not very popular with the police force in Sweden. He's always looked at police performance. And he wanted to, do, to look at what happens when you report an everyday crime. Like somebody sold your bike, or somebody wrecked your car, or somebody broke into your shed and stole your mow uh, What's it called? Lawn mower? Lawn mower. So we went on the air at prime time. And we built a database interface. They actually came to us and said, could you help us manage an, e an email box, sort of an extra email? Could you help us to analyze? If we get on a couple of emails about this, could you help us analyze that? And we said, no, please don't ask people to email you. We'll build a database interface. So we built a database interface. That's the professor. Uh, about this crime, help us find the crimes. And you could then, 
by steering the people. This is not by steering the, the, for instance, they had to choose what kind of crime they had been, stealing a bike, stealing a moped, stealing a motorcycle, uh, breaking an entry in, in, my, in my shed, in my car, and that sort of thing. And we also asked them to tell us where they lived uh, and a little other sort of little story about what, they, what happened. And we, of course, also asked them for contact information. And we were very clear that this will not, we will not publish any contact information. But by doing that, the first morning when I came back, came, we had 800 tips in our database, which is quite a lot for Sweden. I mean, we're not, we don't have a big population. And over the time, then, we got over 3,000 tips in this database. And the great thing about doing this as a structured database instead was, of course, that I had, I had the geography. So when the regional office up in the north called and said, we want to do a story out of this database. This is amazing. But we want to do about, we want to do a, about internet crime. We want to do about somebody who gets frauded on the internet. I could then just filter on the geographical area and filter on the crime. And I said, OK, here's 12 cases. You can contact these people and see if they want to be on television. And they had it. So we got, this is the blog post we did when we had over 2,000 tips. We also could see that seven out of 10 of the people that contacted us were very dissatisfied by how the police uh, did. Most of, the, most of the cases were folded right away, even when people had evidence on who did it and that sort of thing. They just folded the cases. And we put the chief of the national chief of police. He's not. He's the guy who's not very happy sitting in between the professor there. And we actually changed the law. They were. We changed the the minister of justice. Made made uh, the the punishment for doing petty crime or much much higher. And she also gave the police more resources. So in the end, the police actually liked us. Uh, to investigate these kinds of things. So this was basically all I had. This is just a picture to remind you that this is actually midsummer today. And this is the essential things for Swedish midsummer. It's a maypole, it's herring, it's strawberries, and it's a little acrobat. Thank you very much. Questions? <laughs> a couple of questions, but I'm just going to ask, uh, in the interest of getting the next talks ready, uh, could my next speakers in the side rooms, Aeneas and Tyler, go and uh, get set up, please, uh, just in case there are any problems with the AV leads. Uh, that'd be great. Um, and so we'll just take uh, a couple of minutes worth of questions. There's a, a microphone there. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, great talk, by the way. Um, I have some questions. Uh, when I saw the UK uh, poll, I thought that they are from Google Documents. Yeah. 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 How do you test those stuff? So when you look ugly in a, yeah. Yeah. in a way, how do you test those things? I'm not saying you didn't get the poll wrong. You could test those things. How do you do that? To, I mean, that's, I mean, that's like any, I would say like any journalism. I have to test my own theory. So, the, no, the formula was ugly. <laughs> it was the only way of doing it. Um, but, of course, I did a lot of testing to make sure that I, I mean, I, I sometimes I calculate my formulas manually to make sure that I get the same result. I do the calculations in a different way. That's sort of necessary. I sometimes say that I treat my Excel files and databases the same way I would treat an interview person, with the same sort of critical eye. I have to be critical in the same way, and I have to be critical of my own formulas, of course. So, yes, I test and test again, and then I test a third time. And if it's really important, I actually ask a colleague to test. I've got a question over there I can see. Where's the mic gone? Oh, can they, you pass the mic over to the, the chap and then over to the far side, please. You yep. first. Um, obviously, agility is very important to the um, speed. Yeah.
Yeah. We're always looking for new tools. I mean, that is sort of, that's, people ask me, I, I as you can see in this, I, I tend to use Excel a lot for sort of the, the analysis, but when it comes to those kinds of things, we always look for new tools when it comes to P PDFs, for instance, is a pain in the, you know what, and finding new tools to analyze an OCR PDFs is something that we talk about often. So yes. Oh, just one last question, then we're going to have to move on for the next speakers, I think. Yeah. Usually, usually the last way. Actually, the the environmental the, the environmental story I started with that actually started with the database because I knew that that database existed, and I wanted to dig into that and do a story. But usually, actually, it's the other way around. It is a journalistic idea that then we start thinking about what kind of da data could we gather for that. So it's the journalism also always sort of comes first, and the 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 methods and the data comes second. Okay, we'll have to finish up there. Please thank uh, Helena for the keynote. Thank you very much.